uh, we are here today as well uh, as a global learning community. We want to open, uh, offer you an open uh, space uh, to have an open dialogue uh, that hopefully will serve you as a as an inspiration on your way to a meaningful uh, meaningful career. Today we have invited Tahiri to to join and uh, share of uh, some of her insights from her long. Uh, experience with this session we are gonna try to get into uh, a little bit more the concept of uh, wellness and uh, well-being uh, in the work uh, space this is why we have uh, invited uh, Tahiri uh, I don't even know how to define you but uh, I know you are a facilitator a designer a researcher an educator uh, for sure I know you are aiming to have impact in whatever you do and I know you are coming from South Africa. I let the word to you for a brief introduction about uh, yourself. Okay, amazing. Thank you very much. It took me a long time to kind of figure out how to introduce myself. I spent some time because I had all these different interests and I had eclectic uh, career pursuits. And, and I remember I went through a period of time and I settled on a, a, a definition. So I call myself a process designer for people because I felt like that encapsulates the range of skills and interests that I have. Because I, I, I've i worked in education, I've worked in training facilitation, I've worked with children and adults, I've done research, I've worked in government, with local government and with different types of officials, I've worked with NGOs, and, and I have a real passion for for anything which is human-centered, something that, that places people at the heart of whatever is happening and what the changes are. So I think when I when I came across this idea of a of a process designer for people. So that was my that was the term that I that I felt would describe me the most. It creates possibility, which is also something that I really love. So guys, if you would like to start writing your question in the chat, uh, we'll pick some of the question. I just break the ice with one of uh, my question to Tahiri because have read in uh, in your curriculum and uh, background several times that you define yourself as an advocate right for human centered intervention which sounds very cool and i would love us uh, i would love you to explain to us what it means to you you know i discovered i i didn't know about human centered interventions and and i only came across it after i had been doing some work and i was uh, i did some work with a a clinic for about a year and I was supporting them and I was trying to make sense of of what work I had gone through and I came across human-centered design and and it was this whole idea that you basically place people at the center of whatever it is that you do and you and you look at their needs and whatever decisions or interventions or processes that you design it's based on the end user and so you can't imagine an intervention for a team of people without consulting them. They have to be part of the process of, of thinking, of contributing and, and shaping it because it, it makes it so much more dynamic. And, and so what I've seen in a lot of uh, companies or communities and organizations is often people decide who, who are the experts, who are the ones that hold the knowledge and then they sit down and they design uh, an intervention and they, they often don't consult the, the people that they're designing the intervention for, or they're designing a, a product or a service and, and they do it as the expert. Oh, I'm the expert, I have the information. We had a group of experts, we pulled them together, we had a conversation and then we decided what was the best process. Um, and it just rarely works. And, and the ones that I've seen are the most effective is you, you pull together the group of people that you, wanna, that you wanna work with and that you wanna support and you have a really open, honest conversation with them. And you ask them, what are your needs? What is it that you want? How do you want to be supported? What would have an impact on you? And then that becomes the beginning of your process. And, and so I've really been an advocate for that because for some reason, I, I'm not entirely sure, but it's difficult for for businesses to accept it yeah definitely not an easy process however very important i wonder if this is more a need coming from from the organization as such or is more a request from the employee side 
whatever you experience. Wendy, you have a lot of experience in in design and human centered design. I know from conversations that we've had in the in the past, from your experience with Liberty, and I know now you're at Uba. What have you seen the requests come from? Do you think it comes from the top or from people? I would say it's a blend. Yeah. Um, uh, it's a mix. It's it's greatly influenced by the people um, coming from the top, and sometimes it's coming, you know, f- because of um, some type of change or uncertainty, and it influences um, through the people top uh, to the top. Um, but I think it's 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 both sides. Um, but typically driven from the top. Great, thank you. Maybe Eric, would you like to uh, pose your question? So thank you very much. It's very insightful what has been shared so far. So what is the best advice you have received and what this advice may possible for you and others? Yeah, that's such a good, that's a good question. Thank you. (laughs) So what's the best advice that I received and what advice did this make possible? Uh, I think probably the, some of the best advice I received was not to take myself too seriously. (laughs) And, and so, um, and, and not to take things personal. Uh, Because, you know, when, when you work with people or my experience of working with people is, is people are complex and they, as you go through processes of engagement, particularly around wellness and well-being, it, it can open up a lot of things and and make it, um, it can be volatile. So not to make, take things personal, not to make it about me. And, and so what, what that's really made possible for me and, and for others is that people are allowed, have space to just be who they need to be and work through whatever they need to work through. And I can be there and it, it, it makes it possible to accompany people that I can walk alongside and support them. So you basically yeah. get out of the way allowing for the experience to take place. Thanks. Yeah, it's a great piece of advice, uh, but, but sometimes you feel, uh, you feel right that uh, you are mm-hmm. taking it uh, too seriously. Let, let me go a little bit deeper on that. Uh, mm-hmm. Once you feel that, what do you actually do concretely not to take it too seriously? Do you breathe? I would breathe uh-huh. <laughs> and try to reflect on the situation. But <laughs> yeah, I, so I have a. I think I've used um, journaling has helped me a lot to get perspective. So I would. Like in a practical sense, I would write. Sometimes other things when it when it's when it's very intense and I find that something has triggered, because you know you you work with in working with people, it can trigger something inside of you. And in those situations, I'll ask for assistance. So I'll approach people and ask them to to help me. So I will have a coach or I've approached therapists, depending on on the nature of it. But again, um, what I found is preparation before going into engagements is really important and and making sure that that I'm clear when I when I go into an engagement about why I'm there what role am I playing what is the outcome that people are looking for so that I that I always make sure that I make it about the people that I'm interacting with and and the outcome that they seek and and I position myself as the person who's who's there to support them and and so then that also helps me. So that preparation work. And then I also do a lot of work after an engagement. So I will process myself and make sure that I've thought through everything and, and I've reflected on it. And, and, and so that prep in the session um, usually helps me manage or in a, in a training session, I can, I can manage myself. And then afterwards I'll do the processing. And there have been one or two occasions, actually more, um, where I've been triggered by by something very intense, and in those times, I I'll be honest and and ask for some time out, and just give myself space to say I need a bit of a break. Um, why don't we take a break or give ourselves some some space? And then and I, I think that uh, that it's really important to be honest with yourself and see what are you going through, what is what is it that has happened in you, and how you've been triggered, so that you can have that self awareness. And uh, so that's been very hard. So I've had some very interesting conversations with myself to be able to step back and acknowledge what's going on. So if I see that I'm being too controlling or that I've been irritated by something or 
you know, to just really be honest is helpful. Thank you for your honesty. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's not always easy, right? We are mm -hmm. a whole human. And, and I think with your answer, you have probably also given a piece of advice uh, to, to the young adults. Uh, Rhonda was asking in the chat if you could... Uh, share some tools or advices to all these young people that are reflecting on uh, on meaningful career. Let me also ask you if you feel that you have fulfilled your need of a meaningful career. Do you think you have already achieved that meaningful career you were looking for or if you are still in the process? No, I, you know, I, I feel like um, I've been able to achieve a meaningful career many times over. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really grateful for it because the the environments that I've been able to work in and the people that I've been able to work with, they've just been incredible. And and so the, the reciprocity of that space is really where I've derived the meaning from. And and the the quality of the relationships and the opportunities that we've had to to work together. It's it's almost like I it's a it's an ongoing process of meaning. And, and I'm very grateful for that. I think advice to young people, I, I was just talking about it today in, with some young people here where I am in, in Rotterdam. And, and one of the things that stood out for me was we were talking about what it means to be successful and, and what are the indicators of success. And, and, I, and I think my advice to young people is, is to really spend some time and think about what does it mean to be successful to them? And, and what, is, what do they think happiness is connected to? And, and not necessarily assume that what people are telling them is, is what's gonna make them happy. So they can look around at the world that they're in and the people that they're interacting with and make some, make some of their own decisions after they've reflected on that and then use that as a guide. So if they've decided that success means to have high quality relationships, then they can begin to start making some decisions about how they would implement that and make sure that that shows up in their life. Um, if they've decided that having work that's meaningful and it has a, a, a real impact on the world around them, then they should explore it and, and see what opportunities are available to them. But I, but I think there's a lot in that space. So of what does it mean to be successful? And, and it would be interesting from, from the, the people in our group here today to share what are some of their meanings of success around career. I, I would love to hear from you. So for me, it's a good, it's really nice, the meaning of success. Hmm. Uh, for me at this point in time, I think it's the, the coherence aspect of it. So considering that uh, you know we are spiritual beings as well as physical beings and we are part of an ecosystem so finding that that point of coherence and being really like in tune with like solid foundation and and core values that have a positive impact in my environment and myself so become, becoming a channel for those uh, acts of service in a way uh, in a coherent way that for me it's success thank you eric Mariam. Yes. So I feel success is the blending of spirituality along with the material, material world, the two combined in the space of the work that you do, where work is kind of like worship and community flows, life flows into the work life. It blends. There's a support system, community life, work life. There's that balance. And that to me, and where it's nurturing a nurturing space where you want to spend time, like you would like to be with your family. Those are your coworkers. And you can have the open and honest um, discussions, but at the same time, it's super nurturing, super grounding, and super filled with nobility to the point of elevating not only the work you do, but being a catalyst to have impact on society around you. That's my definition of success. Thank you. Wendy. Okay, so for me, um, success um, is, is based and grounded in the spirit of Ubuntu. And so Ubuntu um, in, in, in our context as South Africans means I am who I am because of you. 
So the fact that we we feed off community, you no know, man is an island. So for me, success in, in, in that regard then means, because I am a product of Ubuntu. Um, I've always had people, you know, give me a leg up, people believing in me when I didn't believe in myself. And so for me, success is doing that and being that for someone else. And that is why I love what I do. And I absolutely love when people, you know, come and say, you made a difference um, in my life, something small. Um, yeah. And it's just, you know, carrying that spirit of Ubuntu with me every day and passing the, bait, the baton on to others. Thank you. Well, for, for me, particularly, it goes hand in hand with my, with my purpose as well. I feel that my purpose is to help people get into the best version of themselves. And when I feel I'm contributing to that and I see the results and the happiness and the motivation that they have acquired, then I feel uh, successful in whatever I do. Andrew, please, your thoughts. Yes, thank you. And thanks for this uh, wonderful space. I, it's like so unique and so exciting to be in the space. Thank you very much. And I think, uh, look, I've known Tahiri for, for quite some time now. And the thing that really kind of was, as you guys were talking, the thing that triggered for me is it does take somebody to, to, to light a spark, to ignite that flame and, um, and, and left to, I mean, so I've, I've, I've come in from a, a corporate environment that's been very um, autocratic and it's been through various modes. So we've had autocratic, nice people, horrible people, <laughs> and then we've been through very, and obviously the organizational culture does very much dependent on who's leading the organization and what they're prepared to um, bear for you. And are they in service to the organization or are they out to make a buck? So, and you can see a very different style of uh, organization that, that feeds off that energy. Um, but I think the thing that stood out most for me is, is being that inspiration for somebody and seeing, um, I take guidance and um, a great, I've got a great love for Terry and Eric. And, you know, it's, it's just that being the spark that ignites a flame. I think that is, if you can do that, um, what actually just popped into my brain is um, a, a wonderful quote that somebody measured success by the number of bright eyes around them, not the, the bank balance that they have. <laughs> Thank you. A great insight. Uh, I, I wonder if you are able to have this type of conversation actually with your clients, right? Are you able to make them reflect on, on their definition of, uh, uh, of success? And then maybe Alex, you can uh, tap to that uh, with your question. I think when you're junior or young or at the bottom of the pyramid, you feel it's really needed, but the people on the top, they have different perspective. The people on the top, they think, okay, we need to do this, that, and that. They don't care too much about, many of them unfortunately don't care too much about this kind of spirituality or community building. So one is how can you bring this kind of concept of consultation or community building within the world of corporations at the senior level? And two, if you're at the bottom of the pyramid and you really hope you can bring this bring this spark or this change into your institution what what advice would you give to, to these people i think this thing of getting buy-in from the decision makers and particularly the ones who who have the power uh to to shape the workplace it almost feels mysterious you know like a magical kind of process and but what i can share is is some of the things that i've tried and, and some of the things that I've seen work. So one of the things that I've learned is that influencing your environment is the same. It doesn't matter who you're influencing. So there's nothing special about people at the top. I think, I think one of the mistakes that we make is we think that because people are in the C-suite or they're in a senior management level, they, they need to be treated differently. But influence is influence, and buy-in is buy-in. And so one of the things that, that I found is, is simply relating to, to people in senior positions as people is a good start. And inviting them into a process so that they can share is 
a very good step. So, so really letting people in a senior position have an opportunity to talk because they often have very strong opinions and, and they're sharing them and they want people to listen to them and supporting them to then also reflect on, on whether they think that their current approach is having the impact that they, they really want to achieve. So that's if you have an opportunity to have an engagement like that and you have access to them, I would just see them as another human being, talk to them and invite them to share their ideas and, and to reflect, you know, do they think it's having the impact that they want to achieve? If it's not, have they considered trying something else? <laughs> and and often, often it's an exciting opportunity and, and a benefit for, for a young person who's, who's not working at that level is that often people who are in the decision-making spaces, the only other young people that they have access to are often their children or their children's friends or people that they're meeting in social settings. Often the hierarchy in businesses can be quite tight, right? And so they would need a reason to talk to other young people. And, and when they do have an opportunity, then it, it would be in a social setting. So you can see yourself as a young person who's at the bottom of the pyramid providing the seniors with an opportunity to have, to have a, a meaningful conversation and to find out more about the reality that they're part of. So not necessarily seeing yourself as disempowered. The other thing that I have found when, when just direct conversation doesn't work is to have a conversation, to find a way to, to translate, well, in this case, human well-being into money and cost. Because often decision makers are very motivated by money and cost. And, and they're looking for ways to either save money or make money or improve efficiencies or improve productivity. So if you can look at, at your perspective and what you think should happen and find a way to link it to the strategic objectives of, of the company or the work environment that you're involved in and attach some sort of monetary value to it, it is often a very interesting conversation. So for example, if there's high levels of disengagement in your organization, you can look at HR metrics. So how many days are staff absent from work and cost it? How many days are, how much sick leave are people taking? What's productivity levels? What are those like? Um, what's your staff turnover? How long are people staying at an organization? So all of these things can be, usually within an HR space, this type of stuff is tracked. It's not always shared. Sometimes, depending on the culture within the organization, it can be kept quite tight. If you talk to people, you can begin to collect anecdotal information and then use that information to at least initiate conversations. So those are two of the things that, that I found helpful. Yeah, thank you so much. And just on the last point, so I understand the outcome, the outcome like, mm -hmm. for example, more turnover or more sick leaves, etc. But how can you quantify like, this kind of spirituality. How can you say that some corporations, how can you quantify this aspect that some corporations are much more focused on their employees than others or are more into community building within their corporations than others? And I wonder, like, ultimately, if there is a certain correlation which we can prove. And if we can prove that correlation makes it even easier for the C-suite or the shareholders to take action. Yeah, one of the things that, that we were going to do is an impact assessment around wellness at the organization that I was working with because we started collecting indicators. And, and what was interesting was the indicators that we started seeing were largely in the personal life. So people, as a result of wellness or well-being related interventions, they were improving the quality of their personal life. But when I had conversations with the managers that I was working with, they were interested in productivity. And, and so, yeah, it would be very interesting for others from the group to share if, if they have had any experience in this space. So I think, uh, Alex, and obviously Tyra, thank you so much. It's so insightful what you share. And uh, your question really for me, Alex, brought to mind another dimension. Is, the question is like, is the intervention really in line with what the organization needs? Who knows? If it's a sweet spot that meets the demand of the organization, it will. And uh, I think example and unity are two very strong points. Finding what unites. So like you know, young generations come in, they're very demanding. 
the older generation are against. So there's always a conflict. But if you find what unites people, the conflict is gone. I would do an exercise out of the new master, get to know each other. Holidays. What did you have in common about the, the three things you enjoyed most about holidays? So nothing to do with work. Uh, taking them to a different place. They say, oh, let go. Oh, me too, me too, me too. You got this me too moment and you can, the questions can be more or less uh, deep. And it can be a very simple dynamic when you find what unites you. What unites you know, higher and lower levels is also success. So Tyree mentioned a number of indicators, but sometimes the CEO wants a different kind of success, which is usually the bottom line, there's something else. So what is the success you're seeking? And starting from this concept of unity, what unites the different people, finding what unites different people allows different conversations to be held. And what unites the desires of the senior management with the rest of the team also helps. And at the end of the day, successful. So if you do whatever you do and you're successful, people will pay attention to you. And then you can tell them it comes from a spiritual origin. But first be successful, be really a shining lamp. And that's where the example comes into play. And Andrew, I was listening to Andrew first, and he's well, um, I want Andrew in my team. So just an, and being Andrew or you know, your best uh, Alex or whatever it may be, is a really powerful way that we sometimes underestimate our example, our being, not so much saying you should do this, you should do that. Just be yourself, be consultative, be that. And that's such a powerful influence that we use so little of. So uniting an example could be two other avenues to really move forward. May I ask a clarifying question here? Daniel, for argument's sake here, imagine if the organization, are, the members of the organization are unified on conflict. How does that apply then? What do we do then? One, I mean, Tyree knows better than me, but one thing I would do is vision of the future. So that's where you want to take them out from there. And you don't say, we should fix this, we should fix that, because that's painful. Instead, you say, what's an ideal scenario? What would ideally happen in this company in five years, 10 years? What's the ideal thing? And you take them to a beautiful place where people enjoy being, and then you backcast. And you say, okay, let's start to go towards that common goal. Rarely people say, my ideal place would be a lot of conflict unless it's good conflict, because there's some amazing conflicts that creates creativity and, and good outcomes, but usually you don't really want to go with them. I hope I'm gonna interject here. Continue the last conversation with Alex. I actually wrote some articles about employee engagement, and there are case studies out there of companies that have done really well with employee wellness. And there's a lot about burnout, so, and the great resignation, so there's a lot more emphasis on developing the well-being of each individual, personal and professional. Or the other thing, what made Tahere shift from the world, the diverse worlds that you've been in, I mean, government, education, to becoming human-centered interventionist designer? What, what was the galvanizing impetus for your, um, your shift in your career? Mariam, the thing that, that has made me shift has, has largely been that uh, I've come up against, up against questions that I have struggled to answer. And, and so in my quest to answer things or to find solutions, it has led me into different spaces. Um, and so for example, the a specific experience that led me into education was I was working in a, a museum education program. We were working with children from a very dis, uh, disempowered environment. And I had come from a space working uh, anyway, and I was watching them every day come in for six weeks. And I was thinking about what was going to change, qualitatively change their life. And I was much younger then. What would qualitatively change their life? And I was thinking about all the things that I knew about economic constraints, that there would never be enough jobs when they grew up, that they, the likelihood of them being disempowered economically was going to continue to be there. And so it was in my, um, their family environments were very difficult. And so I would, I would begin to reflect on the reality that I was encountering and, and my search for uh, a way to make a contribution is what has kind of led me into these different avenues. So it's mainly questions, asking questions, trying to find solutions and pursuing interests.
that has has led me in those shifts. And also, I think um, now that I'm reflecting on it, is acknowledging what my strengths are and and where my limitations lie. So, for example, when I was much younger, I I worked with schizophrenics for a year, and I was exploring the idea of of supporting people in that space, making a decision, did I want to pursue it? And so I had some very intense encounters working with with people who had breakdowns. And it was out of that direct experience that made me realize that there are certain types of spaces that that I'm not skilled in navigating. And so I, I started making also other choices when I encountered my limitations. And I thought, okay, so I want to work in this environment, but it's too difficult for me, right? I emotionally wasn't able to cope with it. And so that was also a, an, a journey of a discovery, but direct experience has been very powerful. Does that help? Thank you for your sharing. That was wonderful. Thanks. Oh, good. I'm glad. And then Eric, your question was around what to do with organizations where conflict has become a way of, there's a lot of agreement around conflict and, and people are quite committed to it. And, and I would assume in those environments, the well-being of, of people are, is really damaged. So in those environments, what I have found work when I'm not part of it, right? When I'm not somebody who's suffering as a result of, of the conflict that I'm experiencing, if I'm an outsider coming in to support a team like that, is simply working with the group to get them to a point where they are willing to agree about something, right? And so if everybody is in agreement, then whatever they have committed to will make a make space for another shift to happen. So we just keep working with small shifts um, to begin to facilitate it. So that's as an outsider. Where I've been a member of an of a organization where there is a lot of intense conflict, <clears throat> that one is much harder because uh, it means that my own needs are are jeopardized by the conflict that's going on around me and and so what I've done with those is try to manage upward and and influence the environment from the bottom up and and begin to build groups of people that are unified and connected around things that are positive and to try and create pockets of unity within the organization so we can begin to experiment with creating a different work experience, right? That over time, those small pockets would begin to coalesce and become a source of change within the organization. Because I think when you have that uh, agreement and commitment to conflict, it makes it very difficult to tackle it head on because it just invites more resistance. But I I took the, the concept of yeast and bread, which I love. And so I think if you get lots of bubbles of unity happening, then it sort of disrupts it. <laughs> and then over time, maybe it'll, it'll be like a Coke and it'll just kind of flow over. <laughs> Thank you, Terry, for all the insights. Over to you, Wendy. Um, <clears throat> my question is similar to Eric's initial question, just mm-hmm. slightly different. So Tahiri, I want to know a lesson or a value that someone that you hold in high regard, so a lesson that someone taught you or a value that someone taught you? Sure, Thank that's you. a good question. It's hard to choose. I think I'm, I'm going to say it will, it's, it's a teacher. So I had a wonderful teacher at school, uh, my English teacher. And, and I think one of the things that, that she taught me was that it's okay to be myself. And I think, and I think that was a very kind of liberating experience because often we grow up being told that we should be different and that we're not good enough and we should somehow be adapting to the environment. And when you're given that permission to kind of just be yourself in all of your idiosyncrasies and all of your curiosities and eclecticness, it, it, it really is an amazing experience, right? Because then you can just relax into it and say, okay, great. This is what I've got to work with. This is what the universe kind of provided me. Let me see what I can do with it. And I love and I love that. And I and I've kind of tried to carry that on into all of the the engagements and sessions that I've had or whenever I work with people, is that we come with our God-given talents 
and and I think that's part of wellness and well-being. And I and I've been a like a firm believer in it is is if we embrace our strengths and stop worrying about our weaknesses or the things that we're missing, then it gives us so much more to work with, right? And we can begin to to develop that and build it, and it helps us begin to see the strengths and and what other people also have. So it, it's okay to be who you are, whatever that is. <laughs> 